Russell Brand's a really interesting character. Now, I have to say, initially, he, he wasn't my cup of tea initially. Hmm. Um, and I, if I had to speculate why that was, a little more hippie-ish for my tastes. Yeah. You know? He's got um, the, the spiritual vibe. Yeah. This, and, you know, I was more like, I came from the, like, I'm, a, I'm an atheist, you know, <laughs> school of thought, not like the... Let's feel all the energy, school of thought. I know that's wildly unfair to Russell. Russell, I love you, man. I'm just I'm just trying to explain to people why I was initially sort of not a, a Russell stan. Um, but I actually, I like him now. And the reason I like him is because he is, he's genuine in being like that. Like when he was younger, he was a wild man. He, you know, a drug addict, sex addict, had all sorts of problems. And now he sort of went on a genuine, genuinely spiritual journey and he's come to a place where he seems more balanced and more centered and um, he's doing a, you know, a great podcast, great uh, talk show. He's talked to a lot. And I think he's really good. This is the main point. I think he's really good at going back and forth with people who I might despise politically, yeah. even bordering on they're bad actor. You know what I mean? Like they're not even genuine, yes. not even somebody who genuinely disagrees with me. Not an honest actor right. who genuinely has different political beliefs but yeah. he is like i'll fucking talk to anybody i'll yeah. talk to any of them if i find them interesting enough so he had on candace owens on his show and they ended up getting into it which is rare for him usually like he talked to ben shapiro who was very cordial even though they disagreed the whole time this may be not as much guys go ahead and run that video the first one Look, i agree but towns. do you not think this individualistic culture is in itself destroying the principles at a spiritual human level of community do you not think when people see this economic inequality this disparity i'm not talking about hating your little rich friend and Lola Bell, or whoever it was, you went round to see her nanny and were infuriated by it, but thought, oh, well, maybe one day I'll have my own nanny. Do you not think that economic inequality creates in a human being a sense of injustice, of unfairness? Because people, do you know what, Candice, 90% of people that are rich, do you know why they're rich? They was born rich. Okay, I can tell you something. I think that economic disparity creates that <laughs> feeling, but a, a fundamental understanding in economics can do help you Do you know that, that? That the most people that are rich are born rich. It's not like there's a tiny minority of people that are like you that come from a poor background and manage to overcome it and this is what's a, pro a problem I've noticed with a lot of great people is they sort of believe that their greatness is something that can be replicated and I don't think it, it can. can I see so I believe in the individual you don't that's I our believe fundamental differences but the primary goal of the individual should be to serve the community I, I, I do not believe that the primary goal of what an do you think the primary I, I goal think of that the individual, once an individual should be feels to serve they the individual served, so you're, you just, you're discounting the human spirit I'm the not discounting yes, it I'm saying that's all let there is you, let me ask you a no there's not in, in, in a humanity, think of animals in the wild. You don't even have to go to humanity. We can just think about animals in the wild. What is our human instinct, okay? Are you going to make sure that everyone on this block is fed before you feed yourself? Do you go around and say, hey, have you had breakfast this morning? Listen. Hey, have you had breakfast this morning? Hey, have you, or are you going to make sure you're eating? And if you have, and if you have an excess, of course you're going to do the human the human condition, and our incentives are going to be to want to help are people. Are you mental? Once excess. The richest fifteen people on the planet have got as much accumulative wealth as the poorest five billion. But you're that's talking, an excess. No, 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 that's no. An excess. Okay, okay. Excuse me. First and foremost, you're talking about literally. 0.00001% of the world is what Let's you're talking about. Okay, Let's but, get them. And, 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 what are, and what are they preaching? What do they want? Socialism, so that nobody else has the opportunity to become what they've become. They're the ones that are pushing, not pushing forward. Socialism. Yes, That's they not are. Socialism. Well, are you kidding? George Soros doesn't want socialist policies. Jeff Bezos, the richest man in the world, doesn't want socialist policies. They oh. want to make sure that no one else has the opportunity Look, to get to where they got. We need to discuss our language, me and you. because We do. Here's what my socialism looks like. Take Jeff Bezos' wealth from him, except for a reasonable stipend for him to live on. Something like, you know, he can have 10 million a year or something. Tax Amazon to the ground. So that so so <laughs> the rich people pay for 85% of all of the taxes. You think they should pay for even more? Do you think that, that's 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 fact. That, that's fact. Yes. Don't look at the, me the, as I'm a, telling that's you. Fact that's a fact. Face. The top 10% pay for 85% of all the taxes. When people say you're, they're going to raise their taxes more, I'm just like, how much more? Should we just say, just pay for all the taxes? A lot to say about that. Yeah, I'll let you add it because I know you wanted to respond to that last part first. Well, first of all, this trope that she's using about the rich people paying all the taxes, this has been trotted out by Republican after Republican for years and years and years, and it is wildly misleading. First of all, they only look at federal income taxes. 
They don't look at payroll taxes, which, of course, wage earners much more so than wealthy individuals are likely to pay. They don't look at sales taxes. They don't look at any of that. They also don't look at the fact that inequality is at such incredible heights that, of course, in any sort of just system, rich people should pay wildly more than they, working class people. Like, they make just completely almost that. all the money. They right. make almost so, all the money. So if they're paying 85 percent of the taxes, maybe they're underpaying taxes. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. But again, even within that framework, it's, it's wildly yeah. misleading yes. because you leave off the table all of the taxes that working class people are more likely to pay. So there's that. I also, you know, one of the things I was thinking about as she was talking and, and Russell says, you know, most people who are rich are, it's because they were born rich. That's certainly true. The other way to become rich in America predominantly isn't by building a product or a service like Amazon that for all its problems, lots of people find extraordinarily useful. No, most of the billionaires are financial engineers. They're not doing anything like good or productive or like hard work, struggle to the top, bootstrap type of thing. They're actively making society worse. And that's the other path to riches. Candace herself is a perfect example of the problem of the American meritocracy, because basically how has she been able to amass fame and wealth? It's by serving as a spokesperson to kind of like, you know, make cooler and younger and hipper these old, terrible Reaganite ideas. So there's a lot going on there. OK, yeah, there is. So let me first I just want to give some some numbers here so everybody understands that Russell's correct when he talks about you can't talk about wealth without talking about generational wealth and without talking mm -hmm. about inheritance. So the wealthiest 10 percent of families have inherited three hundred and sixty seven thousand uh, dollars adjusting only for inflation. So that's quite a big head start. Yep. The wealthiest 1%, um, around 41.4% of the wealthiest 1% say they have inherited some money. So, and you could see the same thing, by the way, when you look at uh, race statistics, the average white family versus the average black family, and there's very little generational wealth that's been built in black families because of the history of, uh, of segregation yep. and official second-class citizenship. So... It is absolutely the case that if you're wealthy, you're very likely to have inherited some amount of money that's substantial. So that's that's the first point. The second point, let me give you some more here uh, numbers. 70% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. These are half of workers make $30,000 a year or less. Workers. So they're working for a living. She's trying to pretend like we live in a meritocracy. People could work full time and not make enough money to survive. Mm -hmm. We don't even have a living wage as the minimum wage in this country. Mm -hmm. She could be doing everything right by the book, busting ass and still not making enough money to survive. And at the same time, at the exact same time, the richest three Americans hold more wealth than the bottom 50 percent of the country combined. So that's like over 165 million people. Three people have more than 165 million people. I mean, it's just. It's so out of whack. Where right. do you even begin? And the thing that I think is most important to talk about here is um, her straw man, because that's yeah. what she does. That's all she does. And and I'm astounded at how sloppy she is and how bad she is at her job in the sense that she's just a lazy propagandist. Uh, one of the arguments she uses against Russell is something I've heard a million times, and anybody who's been online and is a leftist has heard a million times. If you end up talking to a, a libertarian or, or a conservative. Um, they hit you with, do you even economics, bro? <laughs> do you, yeah. you don't even get basic economics. It reminds me of actually one of my favorite tweet of all time, which is like, there's this graph and there's, and somebody says, you see where this line meets this line? That's why the poor should starve. Right. <laughs> like that's, <laughs> no, that's, that's basically the gist of it. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the point that has to be addressed is she says, and what do the rich want? The rich want socialism. Oh, my God. You think Jeff Bezos? Almost... Socialism, by definition, is the workers' uh... own means of production. That would take away all the power from the billionaires. Look at now, what, I mean, look at what he does when anyone even thinks about forming a union. Yeah, right, exactly. Let alone, You think he like... wants to give, up de give Democratic control to his company, to all the workers? That's literally the last thing he would ever like, want to do. Putting a Black Lives Matter banner on the front of your website is a long, far cry from anything approaching socialism that part made me want to just totally lose my mind the idea that billionaires want socialism is beyond so bananas. absurd and so bananas. i love when she says to him the difference is i believe in the individual you don't 
He didn't say that at all. No. One of, one of the people who's like, you know, an idol of mine is Tiger Woods. Why? Because he individually was able to become the best golfer in the world. And, you know, he won the U.S. Open on a broken leg and all that stuff. I'm all about the individual. But that doesn't mean you can't set up an economy that's fair and just to everybody. Is some extent or some degree of inequality, wealth inequality and income inequality, is that going to exist within this economy, in any economy? Absolutely. The question is, how much is acceptable? How much is okay? How much makes sense? When CEOs, they used to make 20 times more than the average worker in the company. Now it's like 350 right. times the average worker. Well, and she also uses this argument that, you know, basically the billionaires have to keep all of their wealth or else they're not going to be motivated to work, which is like, so that's, that's got to be the, that's got to be the thing that's inducing people to go out there and create and go out there and, and do their best. I mean, it's wildly immoral in a society as wealthy as the U S or the UK that you have people going without their very basic needs met when, you know. We can meet them. We can meet when those we needs. We can <laughs> easily meet those needs. And you know what? There's still going to be plenty of motivation to continue to work hard and make your way to the top of the fake meritocracy that rewards basically yeah. the, the greatest thefts and criminals and thieves and grifters of all time. Candace again. The hardest Casey. worker I ever met in my life was living at the poverty line. He worked three jobs. His name was Kevin. I met him in high school. He was an amazing guy. And I watched this guy bust his ass and barely be able to pay the bill. So don't tell me we live in a meritocracy. Oh, if anything, okay. we live in an anti-meritocracy. It is not the harder you work, the further you go. You can be the hardest worker in the world and still live in poverty. That can actually happen. So let me show. There's one more clip here. I want to show that. And then I want to give everybody my overarching yeah. theme here. Okay. Like some of my impulses, Candice, are I just want to, I just want pleasure and fun, and I don't care about anything except myself. That's in me. Mm -hmm. That's in me, and it's strong. But I personally think I don't feel good when I live that way. There are consequences for me, and there are consequences for other others. So I kind of want to live within systems that um, encourage collective and communal values the that instead theft. of we're talking about theft no we're not talking about demanding theft. that people give up their stuff as theft but it sounds pretty when you say listen encourage you. incentives no when the government comes and demands not, that i give bringing, to someone no, else uh, listen, that's you, theft. you keep translating what i'm saying I'm helping into, you. no you're not helping me you're, <laughs> he's you're talking about theft you're translating what i'm saying into rhetoric that you can argue with creating straw men of my words as we go it's so you can man. kick them that over theft. no that, that that's I'm not saying that. I'm saying I'm not saying I'm not espousing the values of big government. I'm not saying that there's any political party that currently exists that in any way represents my views. I'm just asking if in politics, both personally and collectively, there's room for a little more compassion and love. And whilst I agree with your uh, that the uh, that there is something easy to fetishize about mm -hmm. individual achievements that in your own case or wherever we see greatness, we can't take that example of the ability of the individual to overcome adversity to condemn people that haven't been able to like where is there a role then for compassion and kindness i'm not saying this not a big politics. government and take away not all your in politics so my thing is that the, the conversation could be should be completely separate okay that is hilarious like you gotta take all these political ideas and just don't involve them in politics right they're inherently Just political of course hope you're that to... the billionaires are super generous because of course they will be just look at the evidence it's like what are you talking about the other thing she she does this thing of like you're talking about theft oh you're talking about theft. <gasps> think of how radical a position it is to actually what she's saying there is literally all taxation is theft that's yeah right that's an ayn rand position. i mean that is it's... a super fringe radical denying basic, ideology the basic social contract she's saying there is no such thing as a social right. contract at that all it means like we're basically not going to exist together in a society and do anything collectively That's together right. we're going to have private we're going to privately fund roads if you can't afford the fire department forget about it forget about getting health care if you can't afford it i mean no public goods whatsoever that is an insanely radical position. Unserious is and what it is. It's totally unserious, and yet she's trying to straw man him like he's the radical for saying, yeah. hey, you know, we could probably, like, do a little better by people and meet their basic needs. And by the way, ironically, she actually supports theft. 
Because she's saying all these people who work for a business owner do all the work, and if they want to underpay you like crazy mm -hmm. and take all your surplus value, they're going to do that. Yeah, total and she's totally fine with that. Wage theft, I'm going to guess, is not a big priority for her. Exactly. Only, you know, any sort of taxation. She, Pretty wild. She would be the type to say, like, well, you just work harder. If there's an issue, just work harder, and, you, and you'll get ahead. You'll get that promotion. But there's always been a giant gaping problem with that, which is let's say everybody in the world took that advice. Everybody in America took that advice. They w woke up tomorrow. They went to work. They tried their hardest. They did the best they possibly could. Is it possible for every worker in America to get the promotion? No. There's only going to be some tiny percentage that can get the promotion. So obviously, if everybody does that, it's not like it's going to lead to, you know, a fruitful result for everybody. Some people are just going to work hard and still not make enough money to survive. It's total nonsense. So my main, my overarching takeaway here is this. The big fallacy that people like Candace Owens believe in is that your market value is the exact same as your human value. Mm -hmm. Those things are interlinked. They're the same thing. So if you're not providing something on the marketplace, well, you're totally useless. You're, you don't even really count as a human being. And I can't stress this point enough. People who made it to the top did not just work harder. That's not a thing. There's 2,153 billionaires in the world, and they have more wealth than the bottom 4.6 billion people wow. who make up 60% of the population. Wow. Billionaires have more than 60% of the population. They didn't just work harder. They're not just better than you. They're not superhumans. They haven't figured shit out that you haven't figured out. The system is rigged. The system is broken. And idiots like that, she doesn't even believe in a basic social contract, which means she doesn't even believe in civilization. Right, right. That's exactly right. There's also an irony to, you know, Candace and Turning Point, Charlie Kirk, all these people. They really rose because of Trump. I mean, they've really, you know, come to their own because of Trump. And Trump in 2016, it was supposed to be like economic populist. And I'm looking right. out. I'm for against the, outsourcing. Yeah. And yeah. I'm looking out for the forgotten man and woman who's lost their jobs overseas. And, you know, I'm actually for raising the minimum wage. All of this bullshit. Right. And um, it's pretty interesting. It's it's a per perfect case in point of how Trumpism just collapsed down to like whoever was willing to be the most shamelessly supportive of him no matter what he did. Yeah. Because she truly, I mean, she's parroting these Ayn Rand, Coke industry talking points um, that have been around in the conservative movement forever. Totally old school, radical libertarianism. Movement conservatism, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, she, it's a it's a younger, hipper package of these terrible old ideas. Nothing to do with anything different economically that Trump claimed to support in 2016. It's just amazing how quickly they revert right back to those corporate libertarian talking that's points. Right. And that's, you know, that's part of why she's so useful is because she's willing to shamelessly propagandize these values, which are very, very good for the wealthy, very, very good for corporate America, and very, very bad to um, most people, including significant chunks of that Trump base. She loves defending Amazon. It's a mask off moment. It's a mask off moment is what it is. She's letting everybody know I'm Rush Limbaugh, but I'm a young black woman. Mm -hmm. That's what it is.